Again, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest talking about a vital topic, and I'm really excited about our conversation. We have hosted our guest once before because she wrote an astonishingly powerful book called Paying the Price. And this is a book which has been read all over the world, which has led her to appear on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. This has led her to a career from moving from strength to strength, establishing programs and consulting all over the place. And her main drive is to focus on what does it mean when students have financial material needs that colleges and universities can't help with or choose not to support? How should academia really meet those unmet needs? I'm absolutely honored and delighted to bring Sarah Goldberg uh, to the stage to discuss this and everything else that she is thinking about. Let me bring her up on stage and you can see her. Hello, Sarah. Hi, how are y'all doing? Good. Where are you today? Where have we caught you? I'm in Philadelphia, my home. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, on a very somber note, um, I, I don't know if you knew uh, Temple's president, but um, my condolences if you did. Thank you. Yes, yeah, she was extraordinary and unfortunately was not the president selected years ago when she should have been. And I think we'd all be in right. place right now if she had been. Uh, I agree. That was a sudden loss. Um, but uh, you know, we have a tradition on the forum of asking all guests to explain themselves by introducing themselves by talking about what they're doing next. Uh, so instead of the academic obituary method where you talk about what you did in the past, what's coming up for you in the next year? What are the big projects, the big topics that are top of mind for you? Yeah, well, um, I'm in a very different space than I, I was for the last 20 years. I, I recently, um, I think of it as retired from academia, frankly, and uh, very happily so. Um, so now I am independently working for myself and I'm doing a set of things. The first thing I'm doing is I'm writing. Um, I About 2018, I got a fellowship from the Carnegie to write my next book and I uh, unfortunately never actually had the time to work on it. So I'm working on it now. It will hopefully be called Real College. Mm. And uh, I have a wonderful team of folks. I'm working on my first crossover to Trade Press. So looking forward to getting wow. that out there, hopefully in a couple of years. Um, well, you have uh, a standing invitation to come here when it comes yeah, I appreciate it. It won't be before fall 2025 because my number one priority is to be here as my son finishes high school. Mm. Um, so mm. I'm not going to go out on book tour until he's done uh, with, with that part. And my daughter is launched into high school. Um, mm. I am doing research with Education Northwest, which is a wonderful partner in this work and has been for a long time. And uh, they have a lot of basic needs and post-secondary work. You're going to start to see more and more familiar faces over there. If you're familiar with my work and my partners, we're, we're, a lot of us have moved over there and are doing a lot of uh, cool stuff, uh, supporting institutions with you know, research to help them uh, improve practice. Um, I am uh, still partnered with the Association of Community College Trustees, one of my absolute favorite oh. organizations, and I'm yeah. actively working on a wonderful project called the Kids on Campus Project, which is marrying head starts and community colleges so that we can help address that very basic need of all of these student parents who you know, need affordable childcare. Yeah. Um, and then I have a couple of other uh, smaller you know, one-offs um, but the, the best part is that I get to work with folks that excite me and I spend every Thanks. single day doing things that uh, help me learn. And I think the other part that I think you can all probably really appreciate is I never, ever, ever work more than 40 hours a week. And I'm here whenever I want to be with my kids. And wow. I have to say that we all deserve that in our lives. And it has made me happier than I've ever been. That sounds almost utopian today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you are, but in those 40 hours, you are working up a storm. This is fantastic. No, yeah. uh, really friends. not, to be honest. Okay. I work I work when I'm able and I'm most productive when I've had a good night's sleep and I've boxed. And uh, so I just fit those things in regularly. I'm really, um, really lucky. I'm just going to start imagining you as, you know, as this kind of um, utopian worker, as this ideal. This is great. <laughs> Oh, let me add one more thing. I can't believe I didn't say this. Um, on October 3rd, I start uh, teaching Sociology 101 as an adjunct of the Community College of Philadelphia. That's and I so sort great. of pride myself that this is uh, something that I'm finally going to get to do. So That's great. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited by this. <laughs> um, it's one of the things I love seeing is a forum guest who is passionate about teaching. This is, speaking of forum guests, everybody, if you're new to the forum, uh, I'm going to put a couple of questions to our good guest, um, and they're general introductory questions, but then I'm going to get out of the way and make room for all of you to ask your questions, to put forth your comments and your ideas. So as we go back and forth, start thinking about what you'd like to ask, um, you know, raise the kind of, you know, see what, the, what, in, what intrigues you, and if we've missed something, yeah, that, this is the time, and this is the place to, to ask. Uh, Sarah, you know, as long as I followed you, you've, you've been you've been working hard on, on this idea of real college and trying to get institutions to actually address the reality of students as opposed to a fantasy. And and you've made so much progress. There's been so much work. But I'm curious, in the year 2023, why do some colleges and universities still fail to actually account for the lived reality of their students? We should know better by now, right? What, what's what's the what's the source of that gap? It's because the myth is so powerful and so useful to so hmm. many parts of higher education, especially the the parts of higher education that already come from the most privileged and have the most power hmm. historically. You know, I mean, we benefit a lot from these stories that we're told about, you know, um, what it is that we gain from college economically rather than, you know, gain from college in terms of our health and well-being and our actual learning, because that props up the student debt system. Um, we gain a lot from stories that we tell about how there's all these colleges that aren't really worth going to. And so what you should really do is engage in fierce competition to get into one of a 100 that you've heard of. Um, we're even benefiting from this new social mobility narrative that has replaced other narratives. You know, I, I saw Chris Newfield uh, starting to dissect this the other day on Twitter, and he's on the right track. And I think, frankly, that I could add more to that. You know, I think, I think frankly, that just looking at whether you're going to move up in the world as a result of education is a really narrow way to think about the purposes and functions of education. And we should know better because we're living in the middle of a crisis of democracy, um, and we've just lived through a major public health crisis. And if we're not viewing higher ed as part of the solution to both of those things, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. we're not noticing that education right now is viewed as a threat, like that people are actually afraid that their children might learn something that isn't what they've indoctrinated them to think. Um, people are afraid of folks having second and third chances in life because they might actually gain power in society, um, you know, and if folks would rather that we not have access to the skills needed to navigate our own health in an incredibly complex world, yes. then I, if, you know, if we really recognize all of that fear, then we can see why they want so badly to perpetuate these myths and why all of us, even the so-called progressives and academics who say that rankings don't matter, still just spent a whole bunch of time this week. Oh, yes. Talking yet again about you know, a system that reinvented itself a tiny bit so that it can profit off of all of us, just like the College Board does every single day. We just can't seem to help ourselves. We're so invested and the institutional elitism is so pervasive. Mm. Mm. Let, let, let me ask you to unfold on one point then. The the uh, college mobility myth, what, what's, what's this? Can you, can you say a bit more about your thinking on that? Well, I mean, look, you know, Raj Chetty, uh, being an economist, first of all, starts from a place of immense privilege there. So, you know, if he says, um, you know, there are places that don't take many students who really receive the big ROI as we like to calculate it, which is to say, mm -hmm. if you start at point one and you move up in the world, which, mm -hmm. by the way, is, you know, the way that capitalist society in this country likes us to think about things. It's not, mm -hmm. it would be bad if we were all at the same level, right? Because we don't only really know how we're doing relative to other people. Somebody has to be below us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, takes the things that we've known in higher ed forever, which is that, you know, um, gatekeeping is a central function. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, there's this right to fail in higher ed um, that means that people necessarily won't finish because, frankly, some people aren't smart enough, don't deserve to finish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, gosh. I've watched so many faculty internalize that to the point that like an engineering professor will tell me, it's really good that I weed these students out of mm -hmm. my class because, you know, God forbid that someday one of them build a bridge and they didn't do it well and it falls down and I get blamed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. You have that realized, like, really? You think that, right? Um, 
you know, so he's 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 codified all of this in a set of he's quantified it, which, of course, is the most powerful thing one can do. Right. Is quantify the heck out of it, make it another number and then say, add those things in, um, you know, much like uh, some people who I'm very, very fond of, you know, have said, let's look at percent Pell. Mm -hmm. You can totally game. I mean, if you want me to close the, the Pell non Pell mm -hmm. gap in graduation rates and you want me to consult with you on enrollment management, come on, we'll do it tomorrow. We won't have changed a darn thing. I can also close black-white gaps, by the way. How do you There's mean? There's a lot of trick yeah. in this industry. Oh, so, so you're talking about closing it in a fake way rather than a real yes, way? Yes, closing it in a fake way, not a real way. We, you know, Not all Pell recipients are the same. Robert Kelchin and I have been talking about that for almost 20 years. Mm. You know, we can, we can recruit and admit the ones who get $25 of Pell. Um, they're going to have a higher predicted graduation rate to begin with. And we can ensure that the non-Pell students who would have the higher graduation rates go somewhere else, just mm -hmm. the really grateful ones, right, who are couldn't get in anywhere else and have lower predicted graduation rates. And lo and behold, the Pell and non-Pell rates will converge. We do it, like I said, wow. we can do it by race too. There's just so many ways to manipulate all of this. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and frankly, we could fix that. You can you can fix this. We can we can be one of these places that wants to make everybody have a good, decent local college option. Period. Which was, that was the idea. At one yes, that was the idea, but you know, we're, we're not, we're, we're kind of far down this road now. We're going to need some major radical shift and a lot of people saying we're not well served by this and then voting to change it. I don't think any other force, I really don't. I don't think the private sector can change right. it by itself. I don't think individual students or families can change this by themselves. I think the country has to look and go, you know what, if we don't get more people to think education is a good thing and an affordable thing and a thing that they can actually spend time in their life investing in. Can you imagine if we hadn't expanded access to high school? People were just- If we had not have expanded, yeah. Hadn't. Nobody's, yeah. I have never heard anybody with a straight face say we should roll that back. Yeah, yeah. You know, just, uh, just yesterday on the uh, New York Times podcast, uh, Paul Tuff was uh, making the comparison between the high school for all movement, which is in the 20s and through the 40s, uh, and saying that we should use this as the model for uh, undergraduate degrees. Sure. Some of us have been saying that for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always mm -hmm. love it when the New York Times discovers sociology. <laughs> oh. But when they say it, this usually indicates something happening. Oh, it does. It does. Yes. I mean, you... we, we know this. I mean, they're, they're really, really, people like Mike Rose were writing that 40 mm -hmm. years ago, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Bill Sewell in 1972 was saying that. Like, mm -hmm. we neglect our history at our peril. But we haven't followed this up. And, um, and the, the Biden administration's attempts to try to get some kind of public support for tuition have, have been blocked. Um, do you think we basically have to wait for another couple of election cycles before we can get a president and a Congress that will support that? You get the people that you deserve, is my take. So we haven't paid enough attention to this as a, um, we haven't taken higher ed seriously as a voting issue. Not not in a really serious way. We've taken little parts of it, like the student debt part. I'm not gonna say that that's trivial, but I am gonna say it's it's only really part of the issue. We haven't we haven't you know made it a real centerpiece of any of any of the debates to the extent that debates are real we haven't looked at people's platforms we haven't um we, we just haven't made this central i don't think we've even done it for public education frankly that we've really made it a central voting issue we we talk people vote with their so-called purses and wallets and whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we haven't connected the dots well enough for folks to understand that you know their everyday anxieties and fears um, are both caught up in the way we structured our labor market. Um, we've shredded the safety net and we've grossly undermined um, the ability of education to do what it can do. For people. And so the people who come to us, the students who come to us for an education increasingly come through that shredded safety net and the higher education now has generally speaking, fewer resources to support and handle them. Yeah. I mean, do you think do you think COVID uh, perhaps taught us that we should care more for our students? Uh, I've been seeing I mean, more and more wraparound services as a yeah, ish. I mean, I think one of the things that's really stressful is that we watched some places say during the pandemic, "Oh, I get it now," 
right? And start to lean in to these services, um, basic needs services as an example, but we're not necessarily seeing them continue that support, right? And, and, right. and double down on, take it really seriously. This, this can't be, I mean, look, there've been a lot of really good critiques of the way that higher ed has handled the DEI positions, right? We say, you know, in a post George Floyd era, we have to pay attention to these things. So we hire one person and we stick them in one seat and we give them an impossible job. And when they don't succeed, we let them go and we say this wasn't really worth doing. Well, we're doing that to a lot of basic needs professionals right now. They're mm. not being given the power that they need, the resources that they need, the support systems that they need. You know, we have to case manage students through a lot of complicated things. FAFS is just one of them. Right. We have to help students to navigate things like SNAP, um, you know, WIC, uh, utilities programs and so on. And they don't even have the technology that could help them do that, let alone enough time in their days to do that. And so we run the risk of them looking like they didn't get it done. And, you know. It was sort of predictable. I'm curious, what right now are you seeing? What titles, what positions do these basic needs professionals tend to have in colleges and universities? Yeah, I mean, some of them are being called um, basic needs center directors, mm -hmm. um, basic needs program managers. Um, some folks are just calling them case managers. There is a higher education case managers association. It's a little bit different. HECMA is a little different than what we um, are thinking about here, which is really strongly social work informed case management. Um, in some cases, they're calling like a one stop person. Um, you know, Inside Higher Ed reported that there are more than 400 institutions now that have at least one position with this name. Uh, I would expect more because there's been state legislation to try to push this. Um, like everything else in higher ed, right? It, we want to make sure it's more than just in name only. And my biggest concern is that these folks are often truly fabulous people who've come in with the right values and the right intentions, some of them outside of higher ed. You know, there's I know people who've been hired, for example, from working at domestic violence shelters, hmm. such that have come in with really, really good trauma lenses, right? And and sure. not, I think that's great because the stories that these students, the lives these students are leading, can actually be very traumatizing, also for the staff serving them. Yeah, um, you feel helpless a lot of the time, and those folks come from backgrounds where they're really trained to handle that. But um, you know, like I said, if you don't give them real power and the ability to make changes and do coordination across units and so on. I don't know a basic needs coordinator working in isolation who's going to be able to do this. And certainly not one working alone with campuses of, you know, 400 to 1,000 to 10,000 students who need this help. And that's How what we're learning is the scale is that big. Is a basic needs center uh, the best way for most institutions? Or should there be Are some other structure? Way better than a food pantry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's... Um, that's where we began. I remember the days when we used to really find hope in the fact that we had 700, 800 schools with food pantries. Uh, now they, now that kind of worries me because I'm seeing schools saying we have a food pantry. We're a hunger free campus. Food pantries have never solved food insecurity. They never even made a dent in it. And that's true outside of higher ed as well. Oh. Um, so centers, centers do often things like public benefits access. Um, emergency aid and so on. Now, again, we're treating the effects of the new economics of college here. We're not actually dealing with the economics themselves, right? I would like to see us, for example, really lower the price of rent for people while they're in college. I would like to see us, um, you know, we obviously do have a movement to try to lower the price of books. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But rent is the much bigger ticket item for mm -hmm. the one in five students with a child Child care is a really big ticket item. Access to child care while you're in college has diminished over time as more and more people have needed it. You know, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the solutions, frankly, are not the kinds of things that people think of when they think of higher ed solutions. They speak to the broader ways that we handle financial instability and insecurity in this country. In the, in the chat, uh, our good friend Lisa Durf uh, mm -hmm. asks uh, for you to speak to the root causes here. Uh, what, you know, and uh, and and I think you just started doing that, um, or, or at least talking about some of the uh, getting getting further down the stack uh, below food pantries. 
Yeah, um, so there's, a, I mean, so there's a bunch of pieces, right? So um, let's just talk about the safety net for a second. So, you know, back in the 90s, we all watched as a Democrat, you know, president, Bill Clinton, told us that he was helping low income people by ending welfare as we know it and imposing right. work requirements. Right. Well, guess what? They uh, it didn't work. Um, in fact, it, it just made us think that we would push people out of poverty because we pushed people off of what we called welfare roles. But my first book detailed with, you know, a lot of colleagues did a lot of research and it curtailed access to college for, you know, millions of, of low income people who, by the way, it's their kids who have now grown up to try to pursue college in this new environment and fall short in, in multiple ways. Um, so, you know, revisiting the basic tenets of a safety net and the way in which we give people access to support with dignity in this country um, is one part. Another part has to do with the dignity of work. And I think there are really good conversations that have been going on about you know, who's dictating the terms of work and not just the pay of work, but the hours of work and the lack of flexibility and so on. Um, we have an affordable housing crisis. I can see the chat there and folks think I'm talking about rent control. No, I'm talking about the affordable housing crisis and the fact that there are, you know, from many angles, I think one great book on this is Rick Kallenberg's uh, latest book on why housing has become so unaffordable. It has to do with uh, segregation. It has to do with profiteering. It has to do with nimbyism. Um, college students have gotten caught in the middle. Uh, I think a quick story might help if it's okay. Please, Brian. please. Think, you know, so um, I just came back from Milwaukee. I was really glad to uh, go and you know revisit places I spent a lot of time before. And it was in Milwaukee the first time that I came to understand how irrational um, you know, our policies were if you looked across sectors. So, you know, one day I was at the university there, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and I uh, was interviewing a student and the student told me that she was registered for four courses, but she was dropping two of them. And I started thinking, well, you know, they must have been too hard for her. Uh, she must not have liked them. She didn't like the mm -hmm. professor, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad I didn't make too many assumptions and I just asked her what's going on. And it turns out that that night before there'd been a knock on her door, the, do the, ho the home where she lived with her mother, and it had been the public housing authority administrators because she lived in public housing. They, she was growing up in poverty. She lived in public housing. Mm -hmm. And they told her that either she stopped being a full-time college student and at least became part-time, if not leave, higher education, wow. where she and her mother would have to lose their housing. Wow. Oh and my God. again, if she didn't make the change, it's not just that she would have to move, but because there wouldn't be two qualified adults in the house, her mother would have to move regardless because there would only be one and she was in an apartment for two. Now, wow. is this, does this make sense? Well, look, from the standpoint of housing is scarce and we're rationing it, college students, many people um, think, are relatively better off than the rest of society. Because we have operated with this assumption that there's this giant gate you have to get through, but you don't have to get through that much of a gate to get into the majority of the institutions in this country. You enroll. It's not a giant competition. You enroll. And it's a good thing to enroll. And so this well-intentioned sort of effort at equity is actually cutting off the legs of folks who I think most of us agree are doing the right thing to try to mm -hmm. be able mm -hmm. to have an education. And this is everywhere. This is incredibly pervasive. So when I say make housing affordable, let's like start by just aligning the rules of public housing for college students. Let's stop building these luxurious units on campus where everybody has like their own apartment and some shared space. They're going to live better in college than they're ever going to be able to live the rest of their life thanks to their debt. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to, you know, I know, I think I saw Sean Wooden is here. They're doing cooperative lit living in Florida. Mm -hmm with support from a foundation to do some subsidy. These are not glamorous conditions, but rent-free cooperative housing could make a huge difference for, for many folks. And there are a lot of other examples. So, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, rent control and it's not just a giveaway. It's a temporary subsidy to help people be able to get a college degree so that they can afford to pay for housing forever. Sir, I, I have, I have so many questions and, and responses to everything that you've just so brilliantly said. 
but I, I want to make sure that everyone else gets a chance to ask questions. This is fantastic. Um, so folks in the chat, please um, click the raised hand button if you want to be face to face with us. Um, and, you know, Sarah is proof that you don't have to have a majestic beard to be on the stage. Um, and also, or click the Q&A box if you want to type. In fact, we have a couple of those Q&As right now, Sarah. Uh, this is one from our, our good friend up in uh, Madison, actually, uh, who asks, oop, hang on a second. Press the right button. Uh, John Hollenbeck asks, we always underestimate the robustness of the institution of school. It's from Herbert Klebert. Do we need a new institution rather than trying to fix the one we got? It's funny, Herb Klebert was a member of my department in educational policy studies when I was there. Wow. Um, so well, that's nice to see. Um, look, and I know that there's some folks here interested in alternative credentialing and so on and so forth. I'm perfectly open to the idea that there might be more than one way to do some of these things. I personally don't think it's the top priority or the main solution right now. Hmm. I believe that we need to, um, I don't want to see bifurcated systems. You know, I'm a sociologist. We have theories that are called, and theories that have proven out in the world. One of them is called effectively or maximally maintained inequality. Okay. Which is the minute that, somebody else wants part of something that the privileged have. Mm -hmm. We change the thing itself. We do this all the time. And higher ed's done that, right? We said you needed a bachelor's degree. Then we said you needed a master's degree. Now we said you need a PhD, right? That's part of what's gone on. My concern is that we say, you know, rather than solve the problem at hand in a direct way, Right. Rather than restore or at least try to live up to the promises we already made, we're going to go try to create a whole other approach to this. And I have a feeling that if we do that, children of the wealthy are still going to go down the mm -hmm. traditional path. Mm -hmm. And we know how that's going to be rewarded. Like we know how that's, you know, sorry, my cat's being rather noisy. And ironically, that's Pell making all that noise. That's um, the name of your cat, Pell. <laughs> Well, I hope we can grant Pell some certainty. <laughs> so, you know, again, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I have no problem, you know, with people spending time on developing alternatives. And I totally agree with taking on employers. And I've now gotten to live on both sides of that. You know, I've been an employee. I've also been an employer. I've, I've employed more than 250 people over the last mm. 20 years. Mm. And, um, it's a really tough thing. You know, I got to tell you, you know, one of the biggest ironies is if you're someone like me and you want to live up to your values and running a research center, then you say things like, I don't need a four, I don't care if a person has a four-year degree in order to do this job, or I don't care if a person has a PhD. But if you're in a university, they'll say, well, then you can't pay them well, right. or you can't right. even hire them right. because we don't acknowledge, we, we just don't acknowledge, you know, actual practical work experience, for example, as an actual substitute for the degree, even though it says in the job description that we do. Um, so this is a tough road. So we're still back to those myths, the stories about uh, uh, inequality and, and the elite. Uh, John, thank you for the for the good question and, and, the, and the quote. And, and Sarah, thank, thank you for answering multiple questions at once. Um, we have another one from our dear friend, uh, Stephen Ehrman who's just a little bit north of me up in uh, Maryland today. Uh, and Steve asks, back to an earlier point, do you know of examples of colleges or universities that have made meaningful contributions to affordable housing in their communities? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I would say this is an area where there's just a lot happening at the moment. And so I, I don't know that we can say meaning, uh, I'm a scientist, right? So when you say meaningful contribution, like I would want to put terms around that, that are measurable and allow me to see it a little bit better. Are there promising things happening? Yeah. Um, they're not usually happening with institutions of higher ed by themselves, but rather in partnership. So there are, um, I'm particularly taken with what's happening in Portland, Oregon, uh, between a partnership uh, with an org called College Housing Northwest um, that has really rethought the way that it does its work in relation to both the community colleges and the private colleges and the public university in the area. And remember that, you know, this term college student does not necessarily mean a person even enrolled in a full course, right? A full set of courses. This could be somebody who took a class one semester 
and then was a regular person working in the community, maybe raising kids and then is taking another class, right? So I don't like sort of the distinctions between those categories. And so they actually do end up housing a fair number of people who might not be in college at any given moment, and also those people's family members. And they are finding strategies and ways to blend and braid funding to make housing more affordable. Um, I think that one of the most exciting things is going to happen when the there's a handful of California community colleges that have decided to build housing. And they're doing it at a moment when those presidents have really been schooled in issues, broader issues of affordable housing and housing insecurity in their regions in California. And they're doing it with a lot of consciousness towards the role of their community in their college. Hmm. Right? A community college cannot just throw up housing that alienates the people who live around it. They will pay for that. They will pay for that more even than the public universities pay for that. Hmm. They depend so heavily on their local communities. Yeah. So people like Keith Curry, who are currently building housing in Compton, you know, mm -hmm. are really thinking about how that will affect and how it could benefit um, folks who might not see themselves as part of the college community at that moment. I unfortunately can't get much more specific yet. I'm hoping that we're going to know in a year or so literally what the mechanisms are and how they can drive improvements. But it's it's really around the blending and breeding of funding. It's not all public or all private. Well, thank you. That's a, a perfect answer. And Stephen, as always, Thank you for your question. Um, this is this fits in nicely with Stephen's uh, research agenda, I think. Uh, we have more questions coming in. And friends, these are all Q&A questions. So please feel free to, uh, to add more. And if you want to join us on stage, just click the raised hand icon. Uh, we'll be glad to host you. Uh, and this is from Elmira Janglu, who says, students' access to resources vary based on citizenship status. Any suggestions for hiring institutions to generate the, I'm sorry, to address the challenges experienced by non-U.S. citizens yeah. uh, and undocumented immigrants and so forth? Yeah. Thank you for the question, Elmira. Um, you're right, first of all. Like, we can see it in every data set that that is the case. Uh, you know, this is obviously one of those areas where uh, other policies, right, including immigration policy, um, are going to affect what we do in higher ed. And just like it is, yes, Glenn, that immigration policy is labor policy, right? I mean, this is often the case, these things, you know, and I say that because one of the things that is hard about being a president at this stage is that you need to know these other areas of policy. And you can't just rely on your government affairs people to be expert in that because often they've come out of a narrower space. This is where I am in favor of um, things that are universal uh, and, and ungated and not means tested. And not so, means tested. Okay. Right? So undocumented students in our public schools benefit from the National School Lunch Program, particularly when it's implemented in a community schools model approach. Mm. There's pretty good reason, uh, pretty good evidence that that stuff's working. Uh, you know, I think it's a good thing. I, I think that when, when a student has to put their hand up to say, I'm undocumented in order to get something, whether it's the tuition, you know, the in-state tuition remission or a scholarship or anything else, they run some significant risk. And I'm even very concerned, and I'll just say this, I know that it's going to upset folks, but I'm concerned with this push for everybody to do FAFSA completion. Hmm. Why is that? Well, because it's pretty clear when somebody doesn't have the numbers they need to put on that form, mm -hmm. they use made up numbers. And, um, you know, even where they say they're not going to file it in some states, they do not have sufficient protections around those data. And I have confirmation from folks who know these things that ICE is having access to those those. Mm. Records. Um, and I'm very afraid that the well-meaning you know, equity minded folks who are trying to get students more mm. access to financial aid may, in fact, be creating databases that can be used by people who just want to exit these folks from the country. Um, and I think that if we don't talk about that stuff, then we're not being honest. Um, yeah. And uh, I just, you know, going back to Milwaukee, I literally just met with two students, um, both of whom were enrolled in college last time I had seen them because they are undocumented and because their parents, they didn't get um, they have not been caught or so, you know, ex, uh, deported at this point, but their parents have been. They're no longer in school. Neither one of them is in school. Um, and both of them are working. They're happy to be working. 
But yes, I appreciate Lisa's comment. Self-identifying is like wearing a yellow star. And yes, as a as a Jew, I would definitely say so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Elmira, thank you for that excellent, excellent question. And thank you, uh, Sarah, for that terrifying tour of, of how this is actually playing out. Um, we have more questions coming in. You know, the ice is broken and people have, have more questions. And, and here is one from uh, our mutual friend, uh, Kiel. And, uh, and, and Kiel has a question. Uh, I may need to unfold this a little bit for people for, who are new to, uh, to Kiel's live inquiry. A lot of the Mountain Hill College debt is caused by credential inflation, i.e. increasing demand for master's degrees, law and medical careers, et cetera. How would Sarah address this with her free college plan? So if, if I could kill the uh, kills argument is that we have an increasing demand for more and more credentials, which is for driving more and more students to more and more post-secondary experience, which is driving uh, uh, student debt up further and further. Um, and he, if I'm translating this correctly, kill, you're wondering how free college for all, or at least, you know, well-supported uh, uh, college for all would, would that make that worse? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, it may very well not handle it, but I also don't think any single policy from a single sector is going to handle such a large problem. That problem is intersectional with the labor market, with the behavior of employers. You know, I mean, part of the inflation and such is, you know, how do I put this? Employers are lazy in their hiring. Many of them. They're looking for shortcuts. Right. If we could figure out some ways to, I mean, I, I've, I've tried to ignore the credential. In fact, I advocated strongly within my, my own center that we wouldn't look at those credentials and we would find other ways. And then you get into this fraught area of what HR allows and doesn't, especially around, you know, tasks and assessments and such that can also mm -hmm. be discriminatory. Hiring is a really tough thing. And especially as pools get bigger and we have things like, you know, Indeed and others that make it possible to just, it's like, it's like the common app, right? There's been so many mm -hmm. more applications coming for college. We have to figure out how to ration the spaces. Although what I can't stand is that, you know, if the common app increased the number of applications to college and more people want to go to college, then why aren't we leaning on these colleges to make more spaces for students to get bigger, right? I, that seems like something, but um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's on a single free college plan or anything else to sort of solve for the whole puzzle. We need mutually supportive changes in society and we need to have those conversations. But again, going back to the high school thing, hmm. are we going to blame free public high school, you know, and, and common high school for credential inflation and say we shouldn't have done it? Hmm. Hmm. I, I don't really think do it so. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to go that far. Um, Thank you. Thank you for taking the question um, so seriously. And Kiel, as always, I really appreciate your work on this. We have more questions uh, coming in. This is one that uh, comes back to FAFSA, um, which is something I don't normally get to say, but there it is. Uh, and this is from uh, Liz Stephenson. Hello, Liz. We have FAFSA requirements to get access to all sorts of things, for instance, free laptops. What other ways could be using to get those different services to students without involving FAFSA? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Mm -hmm. Liz, I don't think that FAFSA should be a gatekeeper to any of those types of basic needs supports. Uh, during the pandemic, we we watched, um, you know, the fight that happened in the first HERF, if you remember the the CARES Act under mm -hmm. boss and the fact that FAFSA was used as a gatekeeper for access to emergency aid. And then you watched as administrations changed and we did our best to remove that as a barrier, but it's actually the colleges and universities that kept on doing it in many cases, um, because in this regulatory environment and in this, in this relationship between financial aid offices and federal student aid, they thought it was safer. They thought that they were gonna be accused of giving somebody money who didn't quote unquote deserve it. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same thing with the laptops. You're going to you're going to have somebody say we're going to give it to somebody who doesn't need it. Yeah. And here we are sitting in the middle of the politics of deserving this. And that's not unique to higher ed. That's just that higher ed really loves it, um, because, frankly, I think that higher ed is run by a bunch of people who think that we're more deserving of everything because we have higher degrees. And. I think in a lot of cases, um, and I'm going to say the we here because I think I subscribed to this for a very long time. Hmm. You know, uh, we are better than, smarter than, and more prepared to to decide than others who don't have that. 
Well, we certainly won the educational game. If by we, we mean you know, faculty or uh, staff or senior administration. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, Liz, thank you for that really good question. Again, Liz is from coming from uh, Sacramento uh, City College. Uh, really appreciate that, Liz. Uh, and we have a question uh, from, uh, now see, this does require, this is where you get fine facial hair. Hang on a second, you'll see what I mean. Uh, from Thomas J. Tobin, a, uh, a guest to be coming up in a few weeks. Uh, and uh, Thomas asks this, uh, Sarah, where are you seeing successes toward the efforts you've outlined? Who's doing the work well? And might be models at which we might look. Yeah, thanks for that question, Tom. So that is why I'm writing the Real College book because I don't just want to be able to rattle off I can rattle off a list of places that I am I am really impressed by and that I think are doing the work and so on. But I really want to be able to take you kind of inside that work and show yeah. you how the rules of the game look different, how engagement looks different on the ground, how it's very imperfect. Because, look, I mean, we're doing something. It's a, a lot of this work is a radical act. You know, um, I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, an example um, that. Um, I have to say the chat is distracting. I'm going to try not to look at it. because this okay, Don't worry. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, so look, I mean, you know, uh, Russell Lowry Hart has, you know, to, rightly with his team, won a lot of attention for his work at Amarillo College with Kara Crowley and Annette Carlisle and others, because, you know, in the panhandle of Texas, they decided that the best way to get more folks to be able to complete the education they wanted. And I, this isn't even about just the credential. People started something and they want to finish it. And the way to do that was to see them as human beings, mm -hmm. not just as students, right? Student conveys, you are the learner, you are this, you're supposed to, we're just supposed to focus on this academic mm -hmm. thing and ignore the fact that whether or not you've eaten is an academic contribution and so on, right? Um, and so they created this mantra of loving your students to success. Loving and that actually does success. seem to be getting the work done. This does seem, it's, it's because it starts with culture, it starts with values. And then they started removing barriers based on that. So they said, it shouldn't take forever to get emergency aid. We're gonna, yeah. you know, we're gonna designate one or two people who can make a snap decision and move fast. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna actually engage our faculty in some conversations about the unintended consequences, for example, of dehumanizing people with attendance policies that act mm -hmm. like the person who misses class because they're being lazy is the same as the parent who misses class because there wasn't childcare is the same as the you know person who misses class because they had to go to work, right? That we need to understand people as individuals in order to reach them as individual learners. And even as they've enjoyed success numerically, qualitatively praise winning awards. There's also lots of conflict on the campus. I was really honored that mm. they trusted me enough to show me. So I went in and said, let me see the faculty surveys. Let me see what the mm. faculty say. Yeah. I, don't want to, I don't want you to polish it up for me. I want to see where people say we're lowering standards, right? Where people say um, he's just touchy feely. Mm -hmm. um, this is his personal agenda, right? The, wherever good work is happening, wherever change is really underway, you should also be seeing conflict and resistance because that's how this all gets worked out. And in many cases, let me tell you, some of the best work's going on in places where the presidents have gotten no confidence votes. Wow. Were these two connected? I mean, did, did this work drive the faculty to... In, in not, in the, not in his case, but in other cases that I am going to hold up because I think that they are doing really important questioning of the basic fundamentals and rethinking centering students while also thinking about employer employees, by the way, and their working conditions. It's not always easy to understand. And, um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's just a lot that goes on in the politics of institutions. And sometimes I see a no confidence vote and I think, well, that, that was totally deserved. They are corrupt. And in many cases, I think, what is this person trying to get done that the faculty in their role as faculty, as their mm -hmm. right, is mm -hmm. interrogating and questioning. Mm -hmm. In the governance, in the governance yeah. role. So let me just say real quick, Tom, I have a piece coming out in trusteeship um, where I give a bunch of examples of different institutions that I think are doing good work and I offer some advice to trustees 
um, I thought it would be helpful to summarize in one place and it should be online any moment. Sarah, when that, when that goes live, if, if you want, please send it to me and I can spread yeah. it around. I was well. hoping it'd be out by now. Not quite. Well, the, but there is something that is, that is which we haven't mentioned yet, I don't think. Uh, and Tom, thank you for the, for the really, really good question. Um, on the bottom left corner of your screen, there's a kind of a tan colored button, um, which uh, links to another one of your projects, Sarah. And uh, can, you, can you speak about that while people click on it and run away? Yeah, um, the Real College Resource Library is a free collection that I decided that it would be a good idea to put together because um, when I left the, the last university that I left, I found that many of the materials I had created that were publicly available on the university website had been removed. So there, I've, I've moved a couple wow. of times and it's unfortunate that people couldn't find what they needed. And so I just decided, let me take responsibility for putting them all in one place. And it's a large body of work. And so it's searchable. Um, I'm sure I could improve it. If anybody has ideas for improving it, please send me a note. Um, I've also included the work of uh, people I've collaborated with and also the work of people I just think did great stuff in, especially in the basic needs space that we need to be able to find really readily. Um, and this is not limited to scientific studies. So there's resource guides, there's policy analyses. Um, I have a whole collection of, studio, of student stories that they've told over time with permission to publish. And I'm gonna start putting them up so that folks can use them as they educate each other. Um, you know, it's, it, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's meant to accompany the book someday when the book is done. Well, it's there right now. And so, you know, as, as always, I believe in giving people access to the things for free. And this looks yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, friends, we're in the last eight minutes. Um, and I want to make sure that if you have any questions that have come up, um, please, this is a good time to surface them. If you had a, an idea that came up in the chat or in your own head that we haven't yet shared, um, please pop into the Q&A box or click the raise hand button and I can bring you up on stage. Um, uh, Glenn had a question. But it's actually, uh, I think it's part of a question, Glenn. So if you want to say more about this, uh, let me know. Um, he asks about the AI and cheating epidemic. Um, well, he, Jesse Stommel's here. Um, so that's my first uh, thing. I My take on, Je on cheating comes from what I've learned from Jesse. And we'll have Jesse uh, as a guest pretty soon as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I will say I have not taught since chat GPT merged. So I don't want to presume that my classes will have changed dramatically in terms of my concerns about this. But um, I imagine a lot of my assignments ask students to do things that I think would be hard for chat GPT to mimic. So there's a lot of reflection on their own learning in the assignments. Um, good, good. you know, there's a lot more processing. I have them assess themselves. That's been the greatest thing that I've ever learned. I have to say from Jesse and Sean Michael Morris, because wow, I have not had any student argue their grade since I started doing this. Not hmm. once. I, it hmm. feels like a whole burden had been lifted that emotional labor of, of, of dealing with grade grubbing. That's nice. Awesome. So, you know, but also I think that, um, the biggest thing that, that Jesse has ever taught me is that right teaching deserves all of teaching deserves all of the attention that we can possibly give it that it is it should be um, exhausting in in a good way because it, it it just deserves so much it takes so much to do it and do it well which is why it's horrendous what we've done to teachers at all levels in this country and um, also I have to say that my my starting place with teaching is trust with students and building trust and earning trust both ways. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me as I've like watched this discussion about, you know, AI and cheating that it's mm -hmm. entering into a culture of profound mistrust mm -hmm. that is engendered by faculty who also just every day are around people they don't trust. And it's pretty sick. You know, um, I, I don't, I think it's a tough world. Mm. Thank you for thank you for that answer. And uh, Glenn, uh, good to get a question from you. Um, we have another one from uh, Gail Menzel. And hang on, I may need to um, read this a little carefully. Sarah, there we go. I appreciate you for honesty. 
We need people to be bold and relentless in leading change. In my experience, it wasn't possible in my higher education role. What can advocates do to push the needle? Well, first of all, Gail, I've, I've, I enjoy very much your enthusiasm and commitment to the work. It's important because this is sort of a relentless situation. You know, as somebody said earlier, why does she smile? Look, if I don't take time to smile a little bit in my life, like how do I even get up every day anymore? Right. All I've seen in my career is the many, many ways in which people are being destroyed. And I've experienced being destroyed by institutions um, that, are, that are, you know, again, relentless in their own way. So I think you have to find um, as a sociologist, I got to find humor in the fact that we just keep on perpetuating inequality um, because it's just so textbook. And yet we seem to just rediscover it every day. Um, and I find that mildly amusing in kind of a sick way, frankly. Um, I think the best way to advocate for students is to constantly be looking for ways to do it, big, small, and otherwise, right? So, you know, the next time that a student says, this isn't working, even if you can't fix it for them, just taking a moment to first of all, acknowledge that it's not okay what's happening, you know? to help them see that it's not necessarily a personal problem, that it's happened to lots and lots of people to make them feel less alone. That's a very, very powerful form of advocacy for their own empowerment um, to make them feel seen so that they get up another day. Even if they leave college, they get up another day and they move towards a future. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that we can advocate within our own institutions for, um, you know, even for changes like let's not use the FAFSA for determining who needs a laptop to things like, you know, we really need to really have a plan for moving beyond a food pantry to, um, you know, when this new FAFSA comes out. And I know we've talked about the form, but why don't we talk about helping people understand that, for example, if you're LGBTQ and your parents are not helping you pay for college, that there are new provisions in there that could help you to qualify for more aid. Why don't we take the advocacy stance of telling people that so that they might be more likely to know, right? And then of course, talk to your neighbors and help them understand what you actually do in higher ed so that you can do some myth busting. Mm. We need every single day to go and tell them the real stories of what's really happening on the ground so that they don't think that this is all about Harvard. It is so profoundly not about Harvard. It's just like telling a story every day of your absolute wealthiest neighbor who, you know, who commutes using a private jet and making that sound like that's life in America. That's, uh, that's a popular story too. Um, well, thank you. That's a, that's a really, really good and exciting answer um, and an empowering answer. And Gail, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, we are at our last couple of minutes and, and I wanted to ask one question um, sure. uh, of you, sir. If, if we could pick a, a kind of standard public university. Uh, so not a flagship, but one that works for its state. Um, if you were to successfully mobilize it uh, to actually be a real college, real university, addressing reality, what would that look like in say five or six years down the road? What kind of transformation would we expect to see? First of all, um, I think that any real institution doing this work is going to have uh, a student body full of people who are on their first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth go arounds in their mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. Because it should be flexible and responsive and embracing all of that life experience and opening those doors. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, the conversation about how they're going to pay for it is going to be individualized, but is going to blend and braid from a huge array of resources. Mm. Draw from a school district where we don't just talk about FAFSA, but we talk about living expenses and work, and we talk about the programs that you can qualify for and so on. Um, nice. I think that educators would play a much bigger role, much, much bigger role in constructing the student experience and also would be required to have a lot more professional development to help them align their own views and work with the real needs of students. It would be a regular ongoing kind of iterative, you know, prototyping and testing and improvement kind of process. Um, 
And also, I think that the college or university would operate in much closer um, collaboration with communities, multiple communities, communities of employers, communities of the social agencies in the area, community with health and so on. They would not see themselves as separate from that, but rather just an integral part of the people who work together in a community to do things for the community. Because I think fundamentally, real college is going to be a local thing. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, look, 80% of people don't go away to college. Right. I think right. that number is actually going to grow. Mm. I really mm. do. I don't think it's going to go away. I don't think, and that doesn't mean that people aren't going to see the world and such. It's just that not necessarily the time that we have to, we don't have to put everything on college. College doesn't have to be the only way to transition to adulthood. It doesn't have to be the only way to learn how to, you know, to do your bills. It doesn't have to be the only time that you see the world. We're putting too much on something that needs to be fundamentally about, you know, continuing to advance knowledge on a certain set of things and then be, build the habits of mind to be a lifelong learner who revisits it as needed in your life. So this might be something closer to a community college model in a way. Community or, or state regional comprehensives. And I think that they're mm -hmm. going to look more and more alike going forward. Mm -hmm. I think those lines mm -hmm. need to be blurred. Yeah. They yeah. should, we don't have enough. I'm going to say my most radical thing. We don't mm -hmm. have enough colleges in this country. We just have the wrong ones and they're not located properly. Uh. Ah, not, a, and they're not run with enough accountability, frankly. Yeah. Mm. So, oh, definitely radical statement. Definitely radical statement. And that, I'm afraid, is the radical statement that we're going to have to close on today because we are just past the top of the hour. Uh, Sarah, thank you for being a fantastic guest. Uh, so many ideas uh, and so much passion, and of course, reflecting so much research. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just terrific, terrific. That helps too. What? Where can we find you? What's the best way to keep up with you? <laughs> I'm still on all the platforms. <laughs> They're all under my name. I don't make it hard to find me. Very uh, good. I, I have a Blue Sky account. I haven't started using it. So find me on the uh, the thing I'm still going to call Twitter. And I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook and, you know, my website. That works for me. That Thanks works for so me. for having me, Brian. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, I, I wish you all, all the best luck with all of this. And please, uh, when the trusteeship um, uh, piece comes up, please let me know. Um, so we can see it. And uh, and thank you so much. Please be well. And good luck with this wonderful, wonderful career you have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, if you'd like to keep talking about all of these issues, uh, about real college, about how to support this, how to transform institutions, please keep up with our conversation. Uh, and you can do that on all these different socials, including Twitter and Mastodon. Um, and I am as well on uh, Blue Sky Threads, etc. Just use the hashtag FTTT, FTTE, or at me. Uh, if you'd like to go into our previous sessions, including our first meeting with Sarah Goldberg-Rab or other sections about student support institutional transformation, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, looking ahead, we can take these topics to other topics, including ungrading. Uh, the uh, guest for which was already with us today. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, including uh, what's happening with academic Twitter, Educause, information literacy, intermediate organizations, and more. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to look. And above all, thank you for your great questions and your great comments today. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, September is treating you all well, and that as the semester continues on, that you are all working well and you're all safe and sound. Take care, everyone. We'll see you in online next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>